In this lesson, we'll be finding limits graphically and numerically. So first off, just as an informal definition, a limit is basically a value that the function is approaching as x approaches a certain value itself. So let's take a look at this example. We've got this value 1, and we're looking at the limit as x approaches 1. This limit is from both sides. And so as x approaches 1, we're going to be looking at the function values that come out of this. And the function value here, we can see by zooming in on this portion of the graph. Well, as x approaches 1, from the left and from the right, the function values are traveling up this curve towards this open circle. And so the limit here would be the y value of 3. So let's talk about the notation. As x approaches c, we write this as the limit as x approaches c of f of x. And so all this simply means that it's the value of f of x, the y value, that the function is getting arbitrarily close to as x gets arbitrarily close to that particular given x value, which we're calling c. And we'll talk about arbitrarily close a little bit better and give you a formal definition a little bit later. One more notation is if we have this limit equaling some value l, which is again a y value, we might write f of x approaches l as x approaches c. Now let's take a look at a few numbers. What we can do is we can look at a table of values to see that this limit does make sense to be 3. As x approaches 1, we're going from the left and from the right. So let's pick some values that are getting close to 1. Here's the idea. Let's make a table of values. We'll use x and f of x. And what we'll do is we're going to use values getting close to 1. Let's start with 0 0.9. If we want to get closer to 1, we can also do, say, 0 0.99 and 0 0.999. Then we've got 1 that we're aiming towards. From the right side, we could also try 1.1, 1.01, and 1.001, all of which are heading towards 1 from the right side. What we're going to do is we're going to take these values and plug them into the function x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1. And let's see what we get. I got all of these y values again by just plugging the value into the function. Now that I have the y values, we can look at the trend. As x approaches 1 from the left, the y values appear to be getting very close to 3. And then as x approaches 1 from the right, the y values appear to also be getting very close to 3. So our guess will be 3. And that does make sense, even though it's not a real function value. And that's something else you might stress here. At 1, if I plug that value in, I get a 0 in the denominator. So the function's technically not defined there. However, the limit is. Because we can just say the trend in the graph is heading towards this y value of 3. Let's try to draw this piecewise defined function here. Earlier, we discovered that this limit appeared to be 3. Using the picture we had a moment ago, it had points at 0, 1, and negative 1, 1, and it had a hole in the graph at 1, 3. And it did something like this when we draw the graph. It's not a perfect looking parabola, but that's about what we had. But then we've got the value 2 if x equals 1. So here's your value 2. This makes the graph of the function. Now, the value of the limit, that's the interesting question. Remember, when we plugged values into the function earlier, we were plugging in 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999, as well as 1.1, 1.01, and 1.001. All of these values are not equal to 1, so we would get the same outputs here. So let me just make a comment. Using the same table as before, we conclude that the limit is 3. But now here's the weird thing. The limit is 3. It corresponds to this point here. But the function value is 2. What that says is that the limit is actually independent of the actual function value. They don't necessarily have to be the same. Let's write that down. The limit and the function value could be different. 
let's ask a question that seems to make sense to ask. Do you always get a limit? Here's our first example. Now this is a very strange example, and if you just look at the picture, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on in this center area. So one of the things that you can do is you can try drawing on a graphing calculator and you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and what happens is that when you get into this area you have lines that are going up and down and up and down and up and down and no matter how close you go in you'll still see lines going up and down and up and down so what does that mean it means that the function never settles on some particular value as you get close to zero it keeps bouncing up and down so this is what we call a limit that does not exist Often we'll use the abbreviation DNE to simply say that it does not exist. This is what we call uncontrolled oscillation. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down no matter how close you get, so there's really no way to settle on one particular value. Here's another example. You'll notice that as x approaches zero, you're getting a very large number. The y values are just going up and up and up and up and it happens on the other side also. Because of this, we would also say that the limit does not exist. The reason for this one is infinite behavior, which you might also associate with a vertical asymptote. You don't have a limit where you have a vertical asymptote. And then this last one. The absolute value of x over x is a kind of strange looking graph. It comes from the left to zero, but it comes at negative one for its y value but then it comes from the right at 1 for its y value. So at 0, it's either 1 or negative 1. Well, which is it? This one does not exist as well. This is officially what we call a jump in the graph. Actually, officially, it would be called a jump discontinuity, but we'll define that a little bit later. So here are the three ways that a limit might not exist. You can have different values from both directions. You can have a function going to infinity at some place, or you could have uncontrolled oscillation, or maybe it's just that the function never really approaches any specific y value. Now we get to a bit of a tough part of this lesson, and I will say that this theory is more suited for math majors and computer science majors. However, we will talk about it briefly, just to give you a feel for how a limit really works. Officially, our definition of a limit is that if you have points going to C, C is an x value just like before, and you're looking at x is going to C, we're going to look at an interval around C, and we're going to have some L that we're assuming is the limit, and we're going to have another interval around L. So what is this delta and epsilon? Basically what we say is if we pick how close we want to be to the limit on the y scale, there must be some value delta that we can find so that inside of this epsilon scale we have all the values of x lie in between this epsilon interval. Officially the way that we write this is we say for every value epsilon which is again a y distance we can find some value delta which is again an x distance so that if we have the absolute value of x minus c less than delta meaning that the x values are delta away from c, then the absolute value of f of x minus l must be less than epsilon, meaning the function values are no further away from l than epsilon. So this is a bit strange sounding. Now let's say we pick some value epsilon and we want to find a value for delta. What we need to do is somehow reverse the function so that we can look at x values. Let's do an example with numbers first. So precisely what we're doing here for this particular problem is we're looking at delta and we're trying to find a delta that's going to work in the definition. For the official definition, we're looking for a delta so that if we have absolute value of x minus c, x minus c in this case is x minus zero, is less than delta, and we want this to give us that the absolute value of f of x minus l, which is zero as well in this case, would be less than epsilon, but that's 0 0.01. So now let's simplify this a little bit more. We can say 
absolute value of x less than delta gives, well, f of x is x squared less than 0 0.01. What we do is we work backwards. We actually start with the function part. What we have is absolute value of x squared is less than 0 0.01. And it's a little bit of a lesser known rule that if you have the absolute value of x to a power less than a number, you can actually just take a root directly as long as you leave the absolute values in place and you'll get the right answer for the values of x that solve that inequality. With that said, if I take the square root of both sides, the square root of 0 0.01 is actually 0 0.1. So what we're gonna do is let delta equal 0 0.1 and that will give us the value of delta that makes epsilon work. Now let's do one theoretical limit here. We want to use this definition to prove that this limit as x approaches 2 of the function 3x minus 2 is equal to 4. Now we could draw some pictures and we could plug in some numbers like we did earlier but this in its own right is going to be a theoretical way to show for certain that this works. And I will say that even though we're going to learn other ways to take limits in the future, this particular method is the way that we prove all the rules that we'll use later. Here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to write this as a proof. And so we're going to let epsilon be greater than zero. Officially, by the definition, epsilon has to be any positive number. So I'm picking a random positive number. So then what we need to do is we need to find a delta that works. Often when I do problems like this, I say consider, and I'm going to say delta equals, and leave it blank. I don't know what I want just yet, so I'll come back to that. But then what we're going to do is we're going to go into the definition. The definition says epsilon has to be any positive number, and delta just has to be some positive number that we are welcome to pick. However, we need to pick it in terms of epsilon, so we'll get there. So then what we do is we're going to say then if the next part of the definition says the absolute value of x minus c, but c is 2, is less than delta, then we will look at the absolute value of f of x, which is 3x minus 2 minus l, and we want to prove that that's less than epsilon. So let's start simplifying. We're going to write this as 3x minus 2 and minus 4 is minus 6. You can just drop the parentheses since there's not really anything being used of them. And then I can factor out a 3 and this is x minus 2. But here's the big thing. I know something about the absolute value of x minus 2. It's less than delta. So all I need to do is somehow get this to be equal to epsilon. So what I'm going to do is let delta equal epsilon over 3. Then I get 3 times epsilon over 3, which is epsilon. And that's the end of the proof. Now again, if you're not a math major or computer science major and you're taking calculus, this theoretical background might not be as important to you in the future. However, it's a good thing to be exposed to it. And for those of you who are math and computer science majors, you'll see this again in the future. What we can now do with this theoretical background is in the next lesson we can learn how to calculate limits easily so that we don't have to worry about deltas or epsilons or plugging in numbers or anything. We'll begin to learn what we call the limit laws.